Good afternoon, everybody. I, I think I know most of you, but for any who don't know who I am, I'm Doug Bartlett. I'm a professor of marine microbiology here in the Marine Biology Research Division at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, UCSD. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we're, we're here to hear from the 2019 Cody Award winner, who is Professor Antia Botius. Um, let me say a, a little bit about the, the Cody Award. So this is an award that's given every other year, and uh, it recognizes outstanding scientific achievement in one of three different areas. So we have oceanography, we have ocean biosciences, and we have the earth sciences. And I think today we have a bonus because our, our uh, winner and lecturer excels in all three of those areas. So that's, that's really special. The award was established by an endowment from the late Robert Cody and his wife, Betty, with a substantial contribution from Capital Research and Management Company in recognition of Mr. Cody's service to the Los Angeles-based firm. And Robert Cody's affiliation with Scripps dates back to his interactions with his great uncle, who was none other than William Ritter, the founding director at SIO, who was here as director from 1912 to 1923. Um, so we're going back about a, a hundred years. Um, and, and Robert Cody was inspired by his interactions with his great uncle by being able to go out on field trips with him. And he described those as some of the most rewarding experiences of his, of his life. And I imagine there are a number of people who would say that about going out into the field with our, our speaker to, today. Um, I'd also like to thank the, the members of this year's selection committee. So this uh, selection committee was chaired by Mark Bowman, who's right here, along with uh, Lisa Levin. Lisa's here, I know. Oh, there you are, yeah. And um, we also have, I don't know if Neil Driscoll or Ken Melville are here, but there are other Scripps members of the committee. There are three external members of the committee, and they are Charles Neitrauer from the University of Washington, Heidi Sosik from Woodhull Oceanographic Institute, and Paola Rizzoli from MIT. And Mark, would you come up and say a few words on behalf of your committee, please? I will be pleased to. <laughs> so the, um, the Cody Award Committee had our most recent and uh, last meeting in winter of this year, and we met electronically from points near and far. Rather difficult to assemble this group of people, but we assembled electronically from Ghana, Costa Rica, Italy, Cape Cod, Seattle, and La Jolla. <laughs> And on that occasion, uh, at the winter meeting, we evaluated uh, a really stellar list of people who were the finalists uh, for the Cody Award, but one of them rose clearly to the top, and that is Professor Ancha Boicius, who is the, the, um, the recipient for this year's award. Um, the, uh, so Ancha has been described as a force of nature whose science is transformative and compelling. I'm sorry, this might be a little embarrassing. <laughs> um, in, in her nominating letter, uh, she was cited as brilliant, clever, and highly creative. Also at the leading edge of marine microbiology and biogeochemistry, and she's pushing the field forward. She is a true pioneer. Um, among her many contributions include a recognition of a consortia of bacteria and archaea that work together symbiotically to achieve anaerobic methane oxidation. And what this means in layman's terms is that there are two groups of microbes that working together um, in a partnership can accomplish chemical reactions that neither of them is able to accomplish um, on its own. And these reactions, this anaerobic methane oxidation, has important implications for ocean chemistry, potentially for the ocean acidification problem, for carbon sequestration, et cetera. Her, our, among many other contributions uh, also include the recent co-discovery of direct electron transfer, electron flow from archaea to their bacterial partners, and a recognition of the importance of methane cycling in the Arctic to the polar climate system. Now, one of the indications of the recognition that she's received 
on pre previously is uh, one particular paper that she led, published in, journal, in the journal Nature in the year 2000. Now, at the time that the nominating letter was submitted in, in the winter time, uh, she, the nominator mentioned that she had been, this paper had been cited over 2,400 times, according to Google's, Google Scholar. Well, I just looked, and it's now 2,548 times. So just in the ensuing several months, there have been well over 100 additional citations to this one paper, and many scientists would be happy if during the course of their career, a paper, a given paper, was cited um, 100 times. Uh, that, that work has been called the gold standard for interdisciplinary deep sea science. This and subsequent papers uh, from Dr. Boetius on related topics, quote, change the way deep sea biogeochemistry is done, moving beyond the traditional uh, vertical profiles in the sediments of geochemistry and microbial activity, microbial activity, um, to couple such profiles, those more traditional profiles, with molecular data on the compositions of the communities and understanding their interactions. So comments about Prof Professor Boetius include that she has had a, quote, prodigious scientific impact, that she has made, quote, major contributions in microbiology, biogeochemistry, ecology of the deep ocean, polar science, ocean observing, and climate change that she's, quote, a true pioneer. She's the leading edge of microbi marine microbiology and biogeochemistry and is pushing the field forward. She's an unmatched ro role model for other scientists and that she's a fierce advocate for science, the scientific process, and for translating science into sound policy development and decision making, which we certainly need more of today. Um, Ancha is an active seagoing scientist who has participated in at least 47 ex expeditions uh, that have employed a variety of benthic landers, remotely operated vehicles, in, in concert with her new and innovative me measurement methods. And we learned last night that she, uh, she took courses at Scripps 30 years ago when she was an, uh, still an undergraduate student, uh, and fortunately that kept her on the path in the ocean sciences, and she didn't, uh, she, she was kindled by and excited by the field rather than turning in a different direction. So perhaps we had a little positive influence on her career, or our predecessors did. So the Cody Award is based on outstanding scientific achievement and excellence of a body of work. Professor Ancha Boichius is a highly meritorious recipient of this award. We congratulate her and look forward to her presentation on the poles and deep seas. Okay, I think the only thing left to do now is to re-gift this um, Cody Award. I gave it to her last night and then she had to give it back to me. So <laughs> now we're gonna do it for real. So if you wouldn't mind coming forward, Ansha, I'll make the presentation again. <laughs> I hope that was it for the embarrassing part. <laughs> well, thank you so very much, Doug and Mark and everyone. Um, you can imagine that it is a fantastic pleasure, not only because of this uh, very nice award, but uh, just because it's 30 years that I've been a student here. And the best pleasure of it all is that some of my teachers are in the room. And I really love this. There is Farouk. I took microbial ecology class. There is yours. This is my marine chemistry knowledge. And so, you know, for me, this place is, uh, I always cherished it for my entire career in marine sciences. And it's fantastic, this combination of coming back and being embarrassed by you. <laughs> So now I can uh, discuss some of my research, and that's also a lot of fun because, um, yeah, thank you for the very kind words. The sad reality is I'm just another director these days. 
So my seagoing days, have uh, they are not totally over. I, I have it in my contract. I can go to sea when I want, but um, uh, directing an institute as large as the Alfred Wigner Institute with all the, the various uh, aspects of polar sciences is also very demanding. It's a lot of fun. It's uh, doing science differently, not having the hands in the dirt yourself, but putting data together and encouraging others to do great work. But you will see that in this lecture, I refrain from just giving a broad overview of everything we do. I would like to really introduce you a bit along the path of my career and curiosity when it comes to polar work, but also, of course, the, the big, big questions, how can we be better at protecting polar regions and deep sea that make up most of Earth? So that's, of course, a grand challenge, a grand title. And um, I will start by just pointing out, um, for those of you who are not polar scientists, that uh, the polar part of Earth is really large. During the evolution of, of humanity, um, it looked like that. The, the north and the south pole regions were deeply frozen. Um, much of the, of the soils of the northern hemisphere were deep frozen, the so-called permafrost that you see here in pink. And then you see the ice shields, Greenland and Antarctica. And to me, this was one of the most fascinating things I could learn as a student, that there is this continent, Antarctica, is larger than Australia. And there is like two to three kilometers frozen water as an ice shield on it. And it has always been since uh, humanity basically emerged. And then there's, of course, the sea ice. And the sea ice is an amazing, um, amazing feature of Earth. It is very important to gather sea ice and ice sheets and also the snow and the permafrost. They make part of the Earth and a significant part wide so that you have albedo and that Earth has this friendly climate we're used to. How did we get into a position that we actually, as humans, have to think about protecting the cryosphere? That sounds uh, very strange because uh, Earth and the cryosphere and the deep seas have always been there and humans are just like this, this few seconds on the, on the time of Earth. Um, but it's really a question we have to ask. How did we get there? How did I get here? So how is it so that many of us today, when we do science about oceans and polar seas, think about protection and think about change and dynamics and destruction and all of the things that humans do? Because in our timeline, so these 30 years between me being a young student wanting to learn all about the oceans and today, this has really changed. Our perspective has changed and it's not just because we are over -dramat uh, dramatizing that we um, as scientists are alarmist because we want more research funds. It's the, it's the truth. We have, we have a big, big problem to face. And when I was here in 1989 to 1990, this is one picture I found. I was a young research assistant, and my job was to go out to sea with various uh, Scripps boats, but also off the University of Hawaii, and then take box core samples from the seafloor and sieve them to pick myofauna with other students. I was uh, part of uh, Bob Hessler's and Buzz Wilson's lab over in Hubs Hall and in the ground floor, and I sat there and sorted myofauna. But I knew already at that time that my real love was somehow, yeah, the deep sea, of course, but, but microbes more than myofauna. So I started taking classes, and I started learning about chemistry and the oceans and the atmosphere and microbes. But starting out as a student already with a very applied deep sea project, like the future of the mining of the deep sea floor, this was 89, and so we didn't think much uh, about big problems. Of course, there were problems with fisheries already, but um, there was this issue, could there be this need that we mine the deep sea? And I was interested as a student to learn about such a crazy thing that some people would really like to take out uh, metals from the deep sea. But at that time, my main worry was, when is the next expedition? How can I go to more boats? How can I spend more time at sea? How can I dive? How can I learn everything and see everything? I was really not set out to think I need to protect something on Earth or I need to rescue polar bears or any of that was not in my mind. It was 89. And so still the training here that I received had already important elements that shaped my thinking beyond learning about deep sea mining. It was the greatest curve of all times. Can you imagine that being a student 30 years ago and looking here in the lecture hall 
onto that graph. Of course, it didn't extend all the way to 18. It was going to here. So it was interesting how some people got very excited about debating this curve. But you know, in my classes, there was more debate of seasonality, the seasonality, the difference in the hemispheres, the lifetime of CO2 in the atmosphere, all of that. But I do not recall that we were really honestly fighting much about a trend that you could see at that time that there is a problem, that there will be more and more and more CO2 and that we don't know any end of it. Why was that so? Because actually at that time we were told that there may be only 20, 30 years of oil and gas left and then that, pro that, would, that, that would be ending the fossil fuel time. We, we have to need to look for other energy sources. But I find it amazing to think back today and you can see that the curve has also changed. It's still going up. Going, we have uh, 400, beyond 410 today. At my time when I was here, it was 350. And so our whole perspective changed since knowing about the path of just this one molecule. And so my mindset forever changed onto this idea that I really have to work hard as a scientist and as a director and as, as, a, as a normal citizen to change the path of things when I did one um, specific expedition where I was present out as a chief scientist at sea when we had the greatest sea ice minimum of all times in 2012. So that is my curve that was important to, to really change the way I think. And what did I do? I was out there after I had left Scripps, after I finished my studies at the University of Hamburg, after I did my first polar expedition in 1993. I spent three and a half months in the, in the Siberian seas in the thick ice at that time. And look at the sea ice curve at that time. So the, this line, this correlation line is put today where it has substantially decreased. But at that time, when I learned about the Arctic and polar seas, there was some dynamics, but there was no debate about sea ice shrinking away. It just wasn't there. It didn't exist. In fact, the AVI directors, different from the people here, defended that uh, also the, the warming that we would observe was just, you know, some little zigzag uh, on the path of Earth. It didn't mean anything. So, so it took us very long to change our minds at Avi. But when I came back, so I was there and did my studies. I wanted to find out about deep sea microbes under the sea ice, uh, in the deep sea. Um, and the sea ice was thick and it was uh, very strange for me to, to um, ride the boat and break the ice with our icebreaker polar stern. And when I was a chief scientist to come back, I wanted to really sample the exact same sites where I did my PhD in 93. I wanted to have samples from Fram Strait, where it was ice covered. I wanted to sample the Siberian seas where the sea ice is born and then drifts over to, um, to Greenland. But where we planned our track to go and sample and put landers and instruments, there was no more sea ice. So this was the greatest sea ice uh, minimum of our times. This year, we most likely have a new record. It looks like that right now. We don't know. And then, so at that time, I learned much about sea ice, and uh, we have always these maps that show you the sea ice extent in white. But when you really go there, when you're out there with the ship and you see how sea ice looks like, this is around the North Pole in 2012 in September. So this sea ice, of course, doesn't look like it can carry a lot of polar bears anymore. It is uh, very thin. It looks uh, kind of uh, yeah, molten. It has lots and lots of sea ponds. And here you see our icebreaker polar stern, and there's no ice breaking. It just zooms through the ice as if the ice, if the ice would be butter. And actually, when I remembered then in 1993 in uh, when I was there and how difficult it was to drill an ice core, and then in 2012, it just took like three seconds, and there was the ocean, and the ocean was warm under the ice. So this really changed me completely because I started reading all about what's the response of sea ice to global warming and what, what does the link between CO2 and sea ice, and in fact it's a linear link, so you can calculate, you take a flight and you know how many square meters of sea ice are gone. But what does it mean for life in the ice? So my, my main idea was I would go to the Arctic Ocean and discover all the fantastic new life forms and ecosystems that no one had looked at because there was sea ice on top of them and we have very few icebreakers that we can use to do deep sea work. I have a good friend, Paul Wassmann, from the University of Tromsø, and he also tried his entire life to come up with long-term time series of Arctic life. 
And we put together this nice review paper. And what you see here is now the Arctic again. This is Greenland, this is Europe. Um, and here is Siberia. You see the gigantic shelf seas. So the Arctic is special with all of those big shelf seas. This is the deep sea. And this red line was the average sea ice margin in the past 50 years. So the dots that you see here are various chemical and ecological time series. And you can see already the problem there. Everything is changing quite fast. No observations, no long-term time series observations under the ice in the deep seas, nothing. So I thought this is really, this will be my job. This is what I need to do. I need to manage to have a couple of long-term time series observations going back. And that's what we can do at Avi. We go every year to the Arctic. So I, I really wanted to kick off some research that tells us more about the deep sea, the central Arctic Ocean. What was already dramatic at that time going to polar conferences is, was the finding that within a few years, the sea ice margin has changed from being over the shelf seas to being out over the deep seas. What does it matter? It matters that all the life forms, many of them that we find important, charismatic like the walrus, have a hard time. Because if you breathe and feed on the shelves, but you need to go to the ice margin to eat fish, for example, and you need the ice, the, the ice flows to put your babies because they cannot swing long distances, and you're a mother walrus, and you have these babies with you, you can do some tens of miles with them, but not hundreds of miles. So actually, the other thing that really changed my mind and made me a much more political scientist was realizing that within my lifetime, my generation, the situation is really tough. It means extinction of species. Some of them will not last, and we don't know if we can change our path so that um, some of the polar species will remain. I also noted that with the retreat of the sea ice, there was a lot of tourism. Like once we went with Polar Stern in the direction of the North Pole, we met a Russian icebreaker with some opera music and stuffed polar bears and tourists that pay 30,000 euro for four day cabin ride to have themselves photographed. And uh, so these changes, and then I found the first plastic bag littering under, uh, just at the ice margin. So the changes that we see are really that fast that they go from year to year. And we started out a big um, observatory under the ice. And this was very complicated. It still is very complicated and very expensive. And at this time, even though I'm director of the army, um, we don't know if we can really maintain it. What is the problem with long-term observation under the ice in the deep ocean? Basically, you have the ice on top. It's already difficult to get a ship. Then you have, you have no, no Argo floats because, of course, the ice is on top and they cannot send data. You have a hard time working with AUVs or gliders. Only very brave uh, oceanographers can do that, and they still lose lots of their equipment. And you need the whole Arctic Ocean is super stratified. You have to have moorings or, or things that are in the ice or that, that you anchor that can measure the top 50 meters. And that you cannot do because the sea ice will cut them off or waves will come. So we really worked hard to have a sea ice to sea floor observatory system, um, which is uh, really very, very resource intensive. But now I would like to show some results combined over the past um, 10 years of work to get you into the mood to think about protecting polar seas. So the one big thing that we always forget when we look at sea ice maps is that the extent of the sea ice is one thing. And the satellite that measures sea ice extent, now it's gotten a bit better. We have now the first uh, um, possibilities to estimate sea ice thickness. But usually, the satellite sees the same thing if the sea ice is 20 centimeters or 8 meters thick. But the volume, of course, matters. It protects the sea ice from melting away. In these days, it has uh, been shrinking from my time uh, two, three meters on average, with a significant proportion of the ice being five meters thick, to less than a meter. And this is, of course, critical for the physics of the ice. You have seen the melt ponds. And if there are too many melt ponds, it's very easy to melt the ice from above and from below. In that time that uh, we were studying the sea ice, also the light transmission has completely changed. And you have seen the cracks in the ice. Now, if you have melt ponds and cracks in the ice, it is dark compared to the white of the sea ice, it's often covered by snow. And you can imagine what sunlight does. If it's a bit darker, it will warm up 
the melt ponds. It will warm up the cracks, the leads, and the ice. And it's, when the ice is then pushed around by the wind, it will be pushed into warm waters, and it melts faster and faster, and it's a nonlinear process. So that was a very important learning. And um, some 10 years ago, many people thought about this and wrote about this, and the general assumption was if the sea ice is thinning, if it's melting away, there should be a big increase in Arctic productivity, there should be more fish, it should be very good for some businesses, for some people living up there. So that was a big question we took on. Is there really a chance for much more productivity in the Arctic Ocean? Now those who were lucky enough to um, look carefully at sea ice and microbes in the sea ice, especially my favorite phytoplankton, the diatoms, you uh, would have learned um, at that time already that there is uh, an indication for the Arctic being very nutrient limited. When you take a core, you can see this greenish bottom of a sea ice core. And uh, often when the ship goes through the sea ice, it turns around the ice flows and then everything is brown and green. So the sea ice algae positions themselves right at the bottom of the sea ice. It uses them as a, as a bus for transport. And um, they are locally very concentrated and locally then also more than the free floating um, uh, diatoms because they have a better access to nutrients. Nutrients are very limited. You start the winter when it goes winter to summer and there's the first sunlight, you have eight micromole of nitrate, which means you have a very short time for the phytoplankton to actually grow and feed the crustaceans and they the fish and they the seals. But what people were missing out was the real look, the real view at the ice from the underside. The sea ice is just another type of benthos, a turned over seafloor. If you really can go and put your camera, you can actually see there is lots and lots of life on the ice. There are actually things that look like a bit weird kelp, but these are also diatoms. It's a special type of diatom, which has recently become probably the most abundant diatom in the Arctic, Melosira arctica. And it's a colonial diatom that grows into long chains, very slimy. It can protect itself uh, from, from grazing by some crustaceans and amphipods. So um, that, for example, is not easy to be sampled from a ship. The brave Russian divers that uh, dived uh, some 20 and 30 years ago described that the thick under ice uh, forests, they often said cat forests, but it's really this diatom species that was very, very productive, and the whole habitat for organisms, but these you don't find anymore today because they melt out. Actually, when we were there in summertime, we saw that in many places, these giant forests melted out and sank to the seafloor. What we also found, and this is using the HUI robot Nerez, um, HROV, so with a very fine cable fiber, it's a, probably a bit hard to see, but you see some algae still stuck in there, and then when you look carefully, you see that in this top meter under the ice, there's lots of gelatinous material. Again, all of this gelatinous life at high abundance is really massive amounts. We are out in the middle of the central Arctic now. That cannot be sampled from a ship. If you go with the icebreaker, they are gone. If you try to, to put a net to sample crustaceans or polar cod, there will be no jellies because they're just completely um, destroyed by nets. So the robots were the only thing to tell us, actually, there's much more productivity than we ever thought if there is ice. So the next question was, what's there for the deep sea now? So we have ice, we have the sea ice algae, and we know at the ice margin, at least for two months of the year when there's enough light, there is an active, an active food web going on that uh, nourishes a lot of life. But what's out in the central Arctic? What is food for the deep sea at those times? For this, to find out, you need sediment traps, of course. So for some time, we had moorings in the Siberian seas until it got forbidden. So these days, it's very difficult to sample the Siberian seas for geopolitical reasons. Uh, it's not that the research ministry or the environmental ministry of Russia doesn't give the permissions. It's actually the military or the energy ministry. Every year, another ministry doesn't like scientists uh, to sample the Russian seas especially not with moorings that are, of course, an obstacle to submersible. But we had for some time a record of uh, sediment traps. I love sediment traps because they are so visual. So when you get your trap back from under the ice, which is a difficult business, and you get those traps, you, you, the, the bottles, you can look at the catch. And here you see the summertime with lots of diatoms. And in fact, we found 
that in those years when the sea ice was thinning and melting away, we found large blobs of the melozera, this, this algae that, that uh, falls, that sinks out when it gets too warm. And then, of course, in winter time, there's almost nothing falling. So we wanted to know what exactly is the total carbon flux to the Arctic deep sea, and will it be more if the sea ice is gone, or will it be less if the sea ice is gone? Now, you can start thinking about it and uh, making sense of it, but the first reaction would be less sea ice, more sunlight, more productivity, more carbon flux. We did a, a big survey of the um, Arctic, um, and here you see a plot of respiration rates. Now it's oxygen flux that you can translate one to one uh, more or less into carbon. And then you see here the depth. So this is the margin, 1,000 meters. And then you see the deep seas. This is then, the deep sea is right around the North Pole. It gets four to five kilometers deep in the Arctic. You see some points that are high sea ice cover and low sea ice cover, but significantly we cannot, we cannot really distinguish between them in the central Arctic. So that was interesting that there is an average something like 10 milligram of carbon, one millimole of carbon per square meter and day. That's very little. It belongs to the smallest amounts of carbon falling. I know the eastern Mediterranean has that little carbon falling. It's like a, a, a tenth of a of a piece of toast per year. But when we put our time series together, um, and uh, this is of course a bit awkward because it's from sediment traps from different places, we could actually see something interesting. Basically, in a, during the sea ice thinning, we got an overall increase in carbon flux. And especially in those warm years, when the sea ice was melting away, we got a huge flux, and the flux was explained by the sinking sea ice algae not really by the pelagic productivity, which is interesting. And so we did the first camera surveys at the deep sea, and you're now almost at the North Pole at 4.4 kilometers water depth, and you see that the seafloor looks very littered. And what you see here, all of that stuff here, is sea ice algae. So basically in 2012, when we looked at the Arctic, we were there for the first time to record the massive meltout and fallout of all of the sea ice algae that fell into the Arctic deep sea floor. And we could, because we had two months, we did a lot of experiments with multicora, but we also managed to place our landers on a rope from the ship. The captain thought we were crazy, but we managed to keep a lander on a rope that was hold, held by two people for 12 hours while we had a party on our sea ice in the place we didn't want to let go of the rope because it was six years and then you have to wait forever till you have a chance to retrieve your landers and one of these beasts costs uh, a lot with all of the sensors included. But we did this a couple of times and we were able to place microelectrodes into some of the algal spots and also chambers and stuff and so we could measure how does such a blob of algae change respiration at the Arctic seafloor. So the first surprise was the animals of the Arctic do not know how to eat those blobs. We found only two species, an ophiurid and one sea cucumber here, that actively went to the algal blobs and ate them. The rest of the worms and crabs and the stuff we found um, totally ignored the patches. They had no response to them. The bacteria liked those patches very much. And here you can see how we measured. This is the background. This is oxygen now. It's an oxygen sensor. You see it penetrating to, 40, um, to four centimeters depth. And you see there's almost no respiration because there's almost no food. But where we have these algal patches, you can see that the microbes consume the oxygen to zero. And in fact, we really found in the middle of the Arctic Ocean, we found black patches where we actually had anoxic sediments for the first time maybe in a, f in a million years or so. So this was new. We had a big discussion with the referees that, that had a hard time with this paper because they said, how do you know that this is new? How, how do you know it was not always that way? Because we had fantastic profiles that showed us that even under such a patch, you have a very high oxygen concentration. And only in the patch, you have this consumption. And the time it takes by diffusion to replenish the oxygen in the sediment is, is very long. So we could figure out biogeochemically that we have really recorded a new phenomenon, the melt out and fall of sea ice algae. And by now, it has spread everywhere. We find it in all of the Arctic. Everyone finds it. It also is present for the first time in France Strait. We did more surveys like this. We found that 
besides the CSL defaulting, there is also an enhancement of productivity and sinking of pigments. So we find that in all water depths down to the deep sea. So a big research study we did together with Russian zoologists was now that there is more food in the Arctic, is there also more life in the Arctic? But all of this is so new that the benthic biota haven't, hasn't really responded yet, and also our data are really shitty. They are full of gaps. This is the entire set of benthic deep sea data that we have for this area. So this is um, Nansen and Amundsen basins, and we put all the Russian data that were ever sampled in ours together, at least those that were comparable, and this is all the data we have. Um, we really found everyone who had a sample, and we calculated benthic biomass, uh, carbon production, uh, respiration, all kinds of things. Too few data to find out whether there is a time shift already. But from looking at the organisms, we could see some non-significant changes in that more polychaetes are found in the Arctic basins. It is a very poor life down there in the mud. Basically, you sometimes have one polychaete or no polychaete per box core which is probably the lowest biomass we have on Earth when there is ice on top. But we are seeing slightly more polychaetes. Our good Russian zoologist refused to put a statistically significant trend because there were so few data, so we, we just described it. I would like now for a moment to tell you about the unknown in the Arctic. So I think you've got the picture that you can try really hard to measure change and the change you measure is the absence of sea ice, the reduction of sea ice, the warming of the ocean changes everything from the surface to the deep sea. It will take a few years for the deep sea animals to respond, but basically it is just about melting sea ice, warming the Arctic Ocean. We also find evidence for changed phytoplankton composition, changed crustacean composition. Everything changes at once. Now the Arctic, is known for its high proportion of endemic species. It's a very young ocean. It has its own type of life form. And if you shrink away the Arctic Ocean, they have no other place to go. And that's, of course, really difficult to think about us and our times changing biodiversity in a very remote ocean far away from us. So my big other mission that I always had was learning about these unknown ecosystem diversities. There were all of those stories about the Arctic. For example, there are no deep sea fish in the Arctic, is what the Russians said. There was a saying that um, it is a very inactive, uh, rich system. Here you see Guckel Ridge. And my dream was always, one day, when I'm rich, I want to go explore the Guckel Ridge and do as Mary Saab did, with her amazing imagination, she was the first to, to really find out and draw a map of the Gakka Ridge in the Arctic Ocean and um, to really put this together and go explore this amazing ridge. So here is actually where, this is uh, interesting also for geopolitical reasons. So here again, we are in the central Arctic. This is Gakka Ridge. This is the shelf, the Siberian shelf. And here somewhere is the North Pole. And now we know that the Arctic Council will split the Arctic into pieces of, uh, of the Arctic pie, so to say, and the North Pole belongs to the, the Russian area um, for geological reasons, except that Gakka Ridge is newly born earth crust and it hits right through the Arctic Ocean and is basically the big autobahn where the ice margins sit these days. And this will not, this does not belong to anyone except its human heritage, basically. It's, a deep sea that does not belong geopolitically for no reason to no country. So that's the interesting part where we can think about um, the global relevance of that fraction of the deepest deep sea and ridges and sea mounts and everything. So I wanted to go and I managed with two missions before the director job hit me um, to go and explore this ridge system, it's amazing really. So you're in the ice and under you is one of the largest and the ultra slow spreading ridge on earth. It has a very deep trough and it has thousands of really big seamounts next to it. So I thought I have little time, I have to explore the biggest seamount of them all which is the Karasik seamount and you see it here. And this one has a funny story because it was first mapped by um, uh, submersibles, but totally wrong. They had no GPS and no fixes, so it is all off by a few uh, kilometers and also in height. So we really went and explored one of the largest uh, um, deep sea uh, ridges that they are. 
These seamounts that are called the Karasik seamounts go from five kilometers depth to 500 meter in 20 miles. So they are really steep. And so when you come with the ship and you cross those seamounts, the, the captains that go there the first time will get very nervous because their instruments uh, show it's getting shallower and shallower and shallower and you don't know where the end to that is because it's, it's very fast. Super steep ridges and we had ourselves um, then built this uh, Nui robot, a very nice little robot. Uh, thankfully, NASA sponsored this because they were interested in exploring under ice worlds for planetary research. I still think the best planet to do research on is Earth, but they spent their million euros for letting us hunt for hydrogen worlds under the ice, so hydrothermal vents, seamount discovery. And so we were really the first ones to bring a new type of uh, hybrid robot that runs with a hair fine cable and you can go explore, see, you can even grab things and you can look at the eyes, you can see everything, it's fantastic. So the whole ship was there when we launched that robot for the first time, got lost a couple of times, but then it did this magic dive um, where we were able to really look at things from, from under the eyes. Here you see again the, the jelly that is everywhere in the top meters and then now we are slowly sinking deeper and what was really amazing was uh, when we had the robot in there for the first time, we actually met a fish that did not belong there. You will see that in a moment. That's a fish from the warm Atlantic. It swims with other crustaceans. Uh, sometimes the Atlantic water, that's what we call Atlantification. The Atlantic species go really fast into the Arctic these days. So yes, there will be new species. The Arctic species migrate up into the Arctic because they find a better environment there, but where do the Arctic species go? Now, for us, the amazing thing was to discover for the first time what is there on top of an Arctic seamount at 500 meters water depth. And you can imagine we were all there, even the cook and the Chinese washer, we were all there staring at the camera when the first seafloor pictures came up, and this is what we saw. And we were all in awe, what is that? We are in the middle of the Arctic, close to the North Pole, thick sea ice cover on top, looks like a lot of life. We didn't see any rocks. The geologists were totally angry because they wanted to look at the rocks, but they said, oh, this ugly biology, what is it? And it actually took me a while to understand this is the thickest assembly of Georgia sponges I've ever seen in my life, the biggest starfish I've ever seen in my life, and such a dense population of worms, I told you before, typical for the Arctic, and even at 500 meters, a deep sea coral, right next to the North Pole. So at 500 meters depth in the Arctic, under the ice, you maybe get two worms in a box core if you're lucky. What is that? Why do you have such masses of life on a seamount in the Arctic? It's the first time we see such things, we're still working really hard on it, but we mapped the entire Karastik seamount, not only with the robot, but with our towed camera systems, and we were actually seeing there were two partially meters of these big Georgia sponges. There were like three or four types of sponges. They were heavily uh, pro pro proliferating. Here you see the baby sponges coming off. And they were full of worms. And when a sponge would die, there were really hundreds of starfish coming from quite a distance to eat it because it, turned, it had bacterial mats and stuff. So we couldn't turn our eyes off that environment. It was amazing. And there was something really weird about it because it was sitting on this big seamount, which is an extinct volcano. And under the sponges, here you see the black stuff. Um, so we mapped all of that with our sonar system plus our cameras. And here you see the sonar systems. Basically, the entire seamounts were densely covered in these masses of sponges, as you can see here. But what are they feeding? There was nothing in the water column. There's, there was no special current. We did all of the oceanography tests. We had the big stout eagle book with us, what to do if you encounter a sea mount, so we knew exactly what to do. But the sponges remain a mystery, especially because they have a weird behavior. This is the sponge, and this is the sponge trail. So they slide on their spicules. They move about, and not down the hill, but actually up the hill. And there is something black under them, and this is now my theory that is unfinished. Uh, I'm still working on this. Actually, they sit on an ancient seat, is what I think. There are tube worms. There are little uh, chemosynthetic virus. Everything is dead. So we just got radiocarbon dating. And 
much of the dead life that we find is a few thousand years old. The sponges are also very old. They, when they are babies, they are already 150 years old. So I think they eat, this is my hypothesis, they eat old seep chitin tubes with the help of their bacteria. It's so difficult to prove that. I will really work hard with the postdoc that is sitting on this project. But you know, there is just no other way. How can such an accumulation of sponges under sea ice with no productivity, how can that be possible? And I'm just saying that to show you one example, and I could have like, I could speak for 10 hours as you notice by now. Um, so the diversity of ecosystems in the Arctic is simply fantastic. We have seen none of that. There are hydrothermal vents, there are, there are amazing chimneys that are covered by other types of sponges that somehow are able to tap into chemosynthesis. There are microbial mats, there are metal mats, There's, uh, there are gas seeps uh, that explode from time to time. So it's a new world, basically. Much of the, the venting that we find is hydrogen, actually, so it was a good investment for NASA because now they have a planet uh, with an ice cover and an ocean and a hydrogen-based food web system to explore. But I would like now to, to conclude with making you think about, again about the question of protection. So when did we learn about the Arctic Ocean? In 1893, when Fritjof Nansen set out with his wooden ship Fram, to go and find out whether there was a continent in the Arctic or whether it was just an ocean, that was his hypothesis. So he learned about the drift, he learned about sea ice, he measured temperature, he explored microbes in the ice, and he went, he was basically an explorer at this time. And today, if we're honest, we're not much farther because we're discovering all of these new ecosystems. No one has ever seen them before. We haven't mapped them. We know pretty much nothing except that we know that everything is changing. Why is everything changing so fast and what is about, what can we do about protecting these systems that have always been there since humans crawled about planet Earth? I come back to the Keeling curve. This is the Keeling curve condensed in this big graph of CO2 measured from ice cores and marine sediment cores. And this is the drama of our times. So while of course there have been little ice ages while we lived on this planet, we are living in a time of a CO2 um, concentration in the atmosphere that changes everything. And to try to learn from ice cores and sediments about the dynamics of CO2 and the warming and when it does recover or what Earth does, you can learn one thing. You can learn from the CO2 cores and the temperature proxies that we have from marine sediment cores and ice cores if we make Earth warm by two degrees Earth releases 100 ppm on top of everything we do. That you can learn. What else can you learn? That one should pay attention to scientists. I looked it up again. It was in the 65 report of Keeling himself, that statement, through worldwide industrial civilization, man is unwittingly conducting a vast geophysical experiment. That's a very euphemistic way of putting where we're in and at. So what can we do about protecting? Now this is the global warming map. It's important to look at it because it tells you a lot of things. It's, uh, it tells you on the one hand that the Arctic is warming much faster than everything else and that we are already in a four degree world. It tells you that we have one ocean that has not warmed that much yet and this is the Antarctic, but there is also, things are also changing in the Antarctic. There are parts like the Weddell Sea that, that warm incredibly fast. I could have also talked a lot about Antarctica and the changes of life in here. But basically, this is this one area where it is not changing that fast, except in the past two years, as you will see in a moment. So if you think for a moment, humans and, and ice and cryosphere, of course, when you look at those places, the sea ice, the glaciers and everything, they look like it's not a place for humans to live. It's the world of the polar bears or the penguins. And we are now melting it away for them. But it also, has something to do with us and our civilization. What is it exactly? It's the acceleration of warming that will happen if we take away the white cover of Earth. So the melting, and I've just explained to you how everything changes already in the past five years. It affects the marine mammals, it affects the microbes. Um, we can measure and measure and describe how everything is affected. But what can we actually do to protect or how will it strike back? What I find amazing now that I'm a director 
is every day scientists come back from the expeditions and they report what they've seen. They report about the blackening of the glaciers by microbe that makes them melt much faster than before. They correct the glacier melt rate. They come back from the field trip and tell me how the warming ocean melts the glaciers from underneath. I get to see data about the gas that sits under the glaciers. I get to see the non-linearity of glacial, of ice sheet behavior, where we are just not able to predict right now how fast will the ice sheets melt, break off, and raise the sea level. The most worrisome data that I get to see is from my permafrost people that go out and measure how everything is thawing on land three times faster than we thought five years ago, transporting massive amounts of carbon into the ocean for hungry microbes that might eat it all, make more CO2, change winds, change sea level, change the way we live. Because 50% of people on Earth live close to the coast. I also learn, and would like to talk much more about it, that sea ice is the major protection means of all of those ecosystems. This is the map of today. I'm looking at it every day because uh, we are soon starting the largest uh, polar expedition of all times to the North Pole. And this year might be another record sea ice melt year. In white is where we have more or less 100% ice cover, except that it is full of melt ponds. And this is where it's, how it has thawed. And we still have to go two months before we at, um, are at a time when it started freezing up again. Here you can see that the entire year it has been at the greatest low of all times, and we don't know where it will end this year. Why? And this is, uh, this is from our sea ice buoys in winter time. The most astonishing thing is that in winter time, we get plus degrees around the North Pole these days. Warm pulses, warm air, clouds that stop the sea ice from freezing. So the nonlinearity of the behavior of the polar system is really large. In blue, once more, the sea ice trend for the past, in red, the Antarctic trend. So this was a big discussion always with climate deniers that say it does not matter if the Arctic sea ice melts away, there's still the Antarctic ice and this is growing. But for a few years, we have looked at the huge dynamic of the Arctic sea ice. And from physics, you know that when a system that is uh, more or less stable starts swinging, it might not be up for good. And these are the last few years. And also Antarctica is the first time that we have minima in both Arctic and Antarctica. And now this is where our Earth system models and climate models are not perfect, actually quite weak in saying anything, predicting anything about the future of these ice systems. I turn back to another baseline that we are working on and that is plastic in the ocean. And that's just one example why sea ice is a protective barrier for life in the polar seas. When you have sea ice, fishing boats will not go. When you have sea ice, it's really difficult to drill oil and gas. When you have sea ice, plastic is not falling into the ocean because there are no people. We have a baseline study now from the Arctic where we see that in the few years where the sea ice has retreated in the Arctic Ocean, we have an exponential increase of large plastics. And where the sea ice retreats, you can go the next year and you find the litter of all of us. And it's not true that it's only from Chinese rivers. We pick those plastics up and we look at it and um, you see it's European, Americans, everyone's plastic that makes it everywhere where there is no sea ice as protective barrier. Also, there is, um, oh, my computer says it's time to stop. There is um, the microplastic problem. So snow, let's uh, clean the atmosphere, sea ice has, collects the microplastic, and actually we were really amazed to see that it collects a lot of them, and that when the sea ice melts, it sinks right into the deep sea. So the other issue beyond the warming is really that amazing littering that is everywhere where the sea ice melts. And so the Arctic Ocean and the Antarctic seas were protected through the sea ice, from microplastic littering, in the past few years, where the sea ice has gone, we see the same littering as everywhere else. And then, of course, that's your own work here at Scripps. The sea ice strikes back. When the sea ice melts away, you, we lose albedo, and everything will be much warmer. And I, I think this is a very excellent and interesting publication that I've uh, read on your website. There is this striking back. I'm coming to an end now, and I would like to point out that in my views, there is just one way of protecting the cryosphere and the deep sea and us, and this is fixing 
the way we deal with fossil fuel and we deal with the uh, resources of Earth. So here you see another problem that we have, and this is the way our climate models are able to predict the future of the northern hemisphere. We, have, we are part and are we of the global um, uh, model comparison, and everyone has to admit that they're really bad in predicting sea ice, they're really bad in predicting the fate of the north of the Arctic especially. There is a huge error in the question of what will the future bring if we continue as we do right now, which is a likely scenario, it's not an alarmist scenario, we are on this path, then it might not be four degrees, what we see now, it might be much more. It's in the uncertainty that we have to face. There are tipping points um, of which we will have then no sea ice in summertime, which means changing everything even more. There are new findings from atmospheric scientists and meteorologists that if we don't have this stable sea ice situation that keeps a very uh, clear and fast polar vortex, that we can have this very strange behavior of the jet stream more often than normally, we get an increase of snowstorms, we get an increasing of heat waves in Germany, it's the second heat wave summer, and 50% of our forest is dead. So, what can you do as a scientist? You can go measure, explore, and we will really do much more of going, taking the risk of going out to sea at times when we have no data, like the winter time. So Polarstern will leave in September for one year and do the farm experiments that Nansen did 126 years ago. We will freeze the ship in and uh, we'll um, give a home to 600 people trying to understand how the winter changes um, the weather pattern that we have in Europe, how the winter freezes back the sea ice and everything. But I've, I would think that it is really important as a scientist also to talk about the things you see much earlier. I know that we are, in, in my time at least, we are taught, you know, look at data, talk uncertainties, be timid about extrapolating, be careful about saying something. And when you look at the Keeling curve with which I've started out, or our plastic littering curve, or the sea ice melting curves, we are shy, we do not want to make a big fuss about them, but boy do I wish that 30 years ago, I would have understood the Keeling curve and projected it into the future and understood the risks that are about. Think about how different it could have been had we woken up earlier. So this graph I love because it puts everything in one slide. It shows you where we are with fossil fuel uses. This is CO2 coming from fossil fuel into the atmosphere. This is the sinks that we have, ocean and land. And this is where everything goes that the ocean or land will not take up the atmosphere. And you can see that the atmosphere has to cope with more and more CO2. Also the oceans, they take up a third, that leads to acidification and unwanted side effects. But there is a limit to what the ocean can take. And there is a limit to what land can take. So if we don't change our path, we run into trouble. And there's limited time to change our path. This is the path. All those data are from the global carbon budget. Every year, this is published by the work of many scientists, including some AVI scientists, and I think also here from Scripps. This is the path we're on. This is the path we have to be on if we want sea ice in summertime. This one means uh, if we manage this, there will be just one sea, total sea ice melt in summertime once 100 years. This path means starting 2050, it will melt once a decade or even further. And that's our choice. This is science, this is physics. So the rest is behavior. And that's our choice, and that's what I think we need to fix when we want to protect polar seas and deep seas. It's the first big problem that we have. There are so many more other problems, chemical pollution, fisheries, overviews. I like this paper, and I can recommend it if you haven't read to it. It's from the Stockholm Institute, Valuing the Ocean. And uh, it names the biggest threats, warming, overuse of resources, sea level rise, and hypoxia. But all of them have a part of misusing um, resources of Earth, misusing fossil fuels. And if we could just change our path, I think we are protectors of the realms that we love. Thank you.
we're hearing a lot about release of methane from uh, permafrost, which is furiously melting in, the Ar in, in Alaska and elsewhere. What about release of methane from the oceans themselves? So, the, 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 of course, there's more greenhouse gases than just CO2, and methane is a, a very aggressive one. And uh, in the beginning, when we looked at permafrost melting, the biggest worry was about the release of frozen methane from the permafrost or waking up of microbes making lots of methane. But the data that I've seen very recently show, yes, there is, of course, methanogenesis. There is uh, methane that will thaw. Um, but the amount of carbon that falls as, uh, as frozen plant carbon and as, as uh, humic um, acid and, and DOC is much, much larger than even the methane. So um, the methane values have been a bit corrected, um, but the, the amount of, of, of organic matter that, that falls to the sea has also been corrected. And um, on the path that we are on, we have some 20, 30 years before a gigantic amount of carbon will be burned and respired by microbes and put to the atmosphere. So from the marine cores, we know, and from new proxies, that this has be happened before in Earth history. When we had a warming of Earth by one to two degrees to changes in the angle of Earth to the sun, we had these situations that um, an amount of permafrost melted and was respired that is as large as a third of the carbon of the CO2 we now have in the atmosphere. And that's very important to put those things together. And yes, we need many more data about methane melting and gas hydrates and everything, but we also need the data about the normal heterotrophic CO2 respiration. That uh, is a very worrisome issue that we have up in the Arctic, all around the Arctic especially because the permafrost melting rates have just been corrected and uh, they have increased uh, by 230-40% in the last synthesis of the ones having these uh, temperature measurements all around the Arctic. Additional questions? Most of what you've described is in the Arctic. Um, can you make some comparisons to the parts of the Antarctic where the most significant warming is it taking, taking place, the Weddell Sea or along the peninsula? Yes. So, yeah, I focused on, on one story rather than uh, jumping forth and back um, to the Antarctic. But in the Antarctic, of course, there is uh, also very important research to be done. It, the, the, the new findings of super large polynyas and this rapid decrease of sea ice, uh, we cannot explain very well. No one really knows the causes. It's very difficult to predict the, uh, the Arctic sea ice dynamics. But of course, sea ice is a habitat for Antarctic uh, um, life. So it's the same problem. We see dynamics in the krill populations that we cannot explain. We see um, changes in where the whales are that uh, are difficult to explain. Um, we have the, uh, the big break off of, of uh, ice uh, masses and glaciers that um, is very hard to study. We, we tried to get to some of these new areas where a big glacier came off and we wanted to look at the seafloor to see uh, new types of ecosystems that have always been protected from light and other things, but um, there are too few icebreakers that can really go to those regions because you're, you're caught and trapped in the ice. And there is a big study on the way that the warming Southern Ocean melts the, the the glaciers from underneath, that seems to be a significant problem also. So yes, of course, you, it is as important to, to work in Antarctica as it is to work in Arctica. Not to mention that there is a very scary change with aquaculture because uh, in many places it's too warm for aquaculture and we need more of it. Um, there is a big move of the salmon farmeries to go to Patagonia. And uh, because you have very cold water, so it's very good for the salmon there. And so Chile is just uh, selling out its most fantastic, richest uh, um, fjords. And so that is also a very sad thing to look at, that uh, there's uh, probably no way that we can keep those, those areas pristine. They have uh, the amazing situation that because they're so cold, deep sea species move up to about 50, 20 meters. And um, yes, but then they encounter salmon aquaculture. 
in the future. Um, so I, I have a question about the Arctic. Um, how much is primary productivity increasing? And do you think it'll increase enough that it'll actually take down the oxygen there in a way that could be detrimental to the animals that have obviously evolved in really well oxygenated systems? Mm -hmm. No, because you have so little nitrate. And so with eight micromole, you can calculate how little if you took Farouk's class, you can calculate <laughs> how little phytoplankton production you can have, and uh, this is not enough. The only, the only little anoxia you can get is basically when you have these algal blobs falling on the seafloor, then, then you can get uh, anoxic for a few years. But that's very patchy, of course. You cannot imagine that this would change uh, uh, dramatically the, the oxygenation of the deep sea floor. Last call. Well, in that case, I think we should congratulate and thank. Thank you. Stuff. And thanks again for the fantastic pleasure of the award. I'm absolutely moved to be here and see all of you. So thanks for coming. Okay, let's migrate outside and, and uh, have the reception.